is Valerie Ross. I'm the president of the Virgil Historical Society. We have a big crowd today, so I don't think we'll do our usual introductions. It would take a little too long. For those of you who don't usually come and are here for the train talk, we just have a very brief business meeting, five or ten minutes, and then we'll get on to the train talk. Um, if everyone would be willing to review the meeting, uh, the uh, minutes from last meeting, which is on the back side of our agenda here, take a few minutes to look that over. If there are no other um, corrections, the minutes will stand corrected as distributed here. And let's have the treasurer's report. She's calculating. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Last time the, the uh, balance was $1,776.97. Uh, I wrote a check for our speaker of $25, so the balance right now is $1,751.97. <coughs> Excellent. The report will be filed for audit. And on to new business, um, Lynn Olcott, who couldn't be here tonight, I guess she's ill, she has started with great energy on a project that we've discussed, which will involve getting narrative history of uh, Virgil. So she's trying to interview uh, people from the town of Virgil who've been around for quite a while or have an interesting perspective on the town. Um, She's doing interviews, she's also asking for written submissions, and she would really like some help doing some of the interviews. There's a long list of people that we would like to uh, hear from, so if you have any interest in working with Lynn Olcott and in interviewing some uh, uh, grand citizens of Virgil, it would be much appreciated. Um, Marsha Powell also knows quite a bit about this project, right? So you could talk to Marsha if you're interested or if you have names of people that you think would make a good interviewee. Um, it sounds like a really exciting project and I passed this around at the last meeting. I don't know what Lynn has in mind in particular, but this is a book that was put out by Green and Smithville Historical Society. Same kind of thing. They interviewed people in town who wrote about growing up in town, businesses in town, going to school in green, various things, and it's really entertaining, and there are pictures, and these really are popular, and this could be a good money maker, and also a good way to um, make, a, make a footprint in the community. So you can look at the one that Green and Smith built it at the end if you're interested. So uh, get with Lynn Olcott or with Marsha Powell if you're interested in participating in this project. The other new business, can I just mention yes. one more thing about this? Um, I think Sue is handing out um, kind of a flyer that gives you a little more information about what we're trying to do. And some people have been very hesitant about being interviewed. They thought maybe they just didn't have anything to say. And I'd like to encourage you all, if you've been here, you know, a, a nice length of time or whatever your interest is, um, it, really will add an awful lot. We want a lot of different viewpoints as to what it was like uh, for you growing up in Virgil, living here for whatever length of time you did, whatever uh, you remember of what was going on. So please think about participating in that, as well as helping do interviews. Okay. Yes, we're The other activity that we thought about that we uh, like to do is an October of 2018 or Halloween time cemetery tour here in Virgil. Um, have a little tour of some of the famous graves, tell the stories of the people who are underneath the ground, and then perhaps if we can arrange it, have the group walk to Hollenbeck's to have cider and donuts. I think that would be a fun thing that the Historical Society could um, sponsor and again it's a little ways off but if you're interested in helping out with that project please let me or Marcia know we'd like to get moving with that um, we would like to increase membership <coughs> I made some little basic flyers that just tell about the Virgil Historical Society when we meet what the membership fees are I would like you to grab a couple on your way out and just post them around town or businesses where you think people from Virgil might see them 
at the school, at the store, um, Reef Peak, wherever you uh, might venture. If you could put one of these up on the bulletin boards, it would be helpful. And um, in May, we have arranged with the McGraw historian, Mary Kimberly, and Sharon Stevens, I guess, to see the uh, production that they've done on um, the New York Central College. And Lori Tubby mentioned that Marathon was going to uh, be interested in the same thing. So I'm wondering if we could have a combined big potluck meeting in May and maybe have McGraw and Marathon and Virgil all together to hear this presentation. I think that would be fun. So maybe we can coordinate that. Um, are there any suggestions from the floor or comments or desires? Nope. All right. Well, then, let's get on with tonight's program. I am pleased to introduce Eric Robb, who is a retired fourth grade teacher from McGraw and also a train and photography buff. And he's going to speak to us about trains along the Tafnioga. The... Thank you. Thanks for having me, too. Um, wow, you guys have a, I have to say, I've been to a few historical societies, and you have, is this, this is a good turnout for you guys? A good turnout, yes. This is fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, um, how many rail fans, rail buffs, people that like to go to railroad museums? Okay, a few. Um, there's a lot of people that do that, I guess. Um, what I did here, um, when Val contacted me, um, it was after, I guess, Margaret had seen, her mother Mar Margaret had seen some pictures that I had put of um, on Facebook of, um, reopening of the Utica branch of the Susquehanna Railroad. I don't know if you know that the railroad that runs up through Cortland actually starts in Binghamton and um, it comes up to Shenango Forks and then it splits. And one line goes to Syracuse, that's the one that comes up through Cortland. And the other line goes up the Shenango Valley up through um, Oxford, Norwich, and up to Utica and connects with the railroad up there. But in 2006, that line was washed out quite severely in a bad, bad flood. Uh, if you remember the floods of 2006. And if that wasn't bad enough, 2011 came along five years later and wiped it out again, at which point the railroad company, the New York, Susquehanna, and Western basically said, we've had it. We don't have as many customers as we used to, and uh, we'd like to just abandon it and, and maybe tear it up. And um, the, several organizations, including the county, jumped in and said they wanted to have the line repaired, um, and they did that. Um, they got many millions of, se several millions of dollars um, from, in grants and aid from the, from the state and the national government. And I have some pictures of that, but um, I thought maybe you guys would be more interested really to see right around here what happened with the railroad. And we have a great, some great resources um, that I can show you uh, that I used. Uh, let's see if I can get this going. Oops. Okay. So I always follow these rules when I'm on the railroad tracks. And I told, told one of my friends who's an engineer that I would say these things to you because um, stay off the tracks. It seems to be a really a, a real trend these days for people to take their prom pictures or wedding pictures on the railroad tracks, and um, it's not a good thing. And that's when you do that, you're trespassing. And one of the things you'll notice in my pictures uh, is that I'm never on the tracks. I always try to stay on public property, whether it's a street or um, a sidewalk. Um, you never know when a train's going to come. All right, and there's one of our trains right there. All right, so here's some important dates that, that, um, that are relevant to the line that comes up here through uh, Messengerville, which is part of Virgil. Uh, in 1836, railroads were almost brand new in this country, and everybody said they're going to have one. And in 1836, the New York State Legislature passes an act for the charter of the Syracuse, Cortland, and Binghamton Railroad. And it's 
nothing was ever done. After four years, the, the law was that it expired. And so they didn't do anything. Some guys got together in 1851 and they said, let's try it again. And this time they actually did get some construction going. And in 1854, the construction was completed and the first train ran between Gettys and Binghamton. Now Gettys is just south, uh, just in the outskirts of Syracuse. Um, the cost of the railroad and its equipment, which would be the cars and the locomotives, was a million, almost two million dollars, one million eight hundred thousand. Um, and here's an interesting thing right here. The line was built to a six foot gauge, and when we say gauge, that's the distance between the two rails. Anybody know what the distance is nowadays? There you go. Four feet, eight and a half inches. So, yeah, how'd they pick that number, right? <laughs> That's the distance that, um, that yeah. Okay, so 1856, uh-oh, railroad's five years old, and it already get, goes bankrupt. And it gets reorganized as the Syracuse and Southern Railway. A year later, they changed their name to the Syracuse, Binghamton, and New York Railroad. And a year after that, 1858, they purchased the Union Railroad, and that allows them to get that last little bit of the way into Syracuse. So now we've got a complete link between Binghamton and Syracuse. And look what they were trying to connect with, the Erie Canal. What do you think they wanted to do that for? Yeah, bring up freight, load it onto canal boats, and then it could go either east to Albany or west to Buffalo or anywhere in between, right? All right, 1858, the Syracuse, Binghamton, and New York signs an agreement with the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad. That's a railroad that started in Pennsylvania for anthracite coal trains to run between Binghamton to Syracuse and Oswego. See, the, that was really one of the big reasons that the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad was formed was to get coal from Pennsylvania and sell it and make money. That was the big money maker for the railroad in those days. Um, why would it want to get to Oswego? Great Lakes. Yeah, to get put on to get put on the boats, the big ships, and the, it could move anywhere it wanted to on the Great Lakes. Um, 1869, the DL&W, that's the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western, purchases enough stock to comp control the SBNY. So now the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western is in control of this line that runs down through Messengerville and all the way to Binghamton. This is interesting. If what we were talking about with the gauge. In 1876, the track gauge on the railroad gets narrowed from six feet that back to what we now call standard gauge to four feet, eight and a half inches. All right? How long do you think it would take to move all the rails a, um, a, foot, and, a foot and a few inches closer together? Why did they do that? Make them all standard. Make them all standard, yeah. Because some were four feet, eight and a half, and some were six feet. So now when you got a freight car and it comes along and its wheels are six feet apart, they can't put that freight car on the other line. So they said, well, we're going to get with the game and we're going to make them all the same. And by the way, um, a really good author and a friend of mine named Richard Palmer, who's written some, written some interesting books, including one about rails through Portland. Um, and I think you can get it at like the Suggett House, the museum, in Cor the, yeah, the museum in Cortland. They have a gift shop there. He just redid the book. I don't have the new copy of it, but he talks about it. He's a great one. He's for um, exploring old newspapers and things like that. And he does quite a bit about the narrowing of the gauge. And you'd think to do 
almost 100 miles of railroad would take you weeks or months, probably would today, right? They did it in days, just a few days. Of course, they hired a lot of extra people to do, help them, and they even had people from other railroads come and help them. Did they move most, most rail or just bring one in? You know, I think they just moved one. Yeah, that's a good question. And they did a lot of things. I know they did the same thing on the Utica line. They had to move the rail over, too. And they did a lot of things in preparation, like they came along and they put took out some spikes and they put new spikes in where they were going to have to be so they could kind of do some preparation ahead of time. Yeah. Yes? You know, uh, prior to 1876, was the, the L and W standard gauge or were they also six foot? It's a good question. Um, I think they were, I, I, I'm going to guess six foot gauge, but I, may, I, I can't tell you for sure. Like down into Pennsylvania, I don't know that. You, what do you think? The Erie was, was six foot gauge. Yeah. The yeah. L and W, as far as I ever knew, was always standard gauge. Okay. So, and I wondered if Erie had the effect on this line being six foot. Maybe they were thought they would connect with the Erie. Right. So maybe that's why they went to six feet in the middle of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, th I think you're probably, that's a good way to think about it. <laughs> All right. So this is. I just, this is the official um, DL and W map. And there's the, the hub down there in Pennsylvania where all the coal mines are. Not so many coal mines right there now, but the Lackawanna was kind of famous for its anthracite coal, the road of anthracite, Phoebe Snow. And there you can see, there's the Syracuse branch. What's that little thing right there? That's, that's the little line out to Cincinnati through McGraw, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in 1880, the, the railroad gets double-tracked between Cortland and Apulia. They put in a second line, so now there's two because the traffic is so high, moving a lot of coal. And in 1912, now the, the uh, SBNY is formally leased to the DL&W, all right? 1951 sees the last use of steam engines by the Lackawanna on the Binghamton line, and that would be when diesels completely took over. This is what the timetable looked like in those days. There's where is it? Messengerville right there. And you can see that there were, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six trains a day. Those are just passenger trains. But Messengerville has a little symbol after it, which means that most of the times those would be flag stops. They wouldn't stop normally unless they'd gotten, gotten uh, advance notice that they needed to stop. Every train would stop in Cortland. I take it back, there's a flag stop for one of the Cortland trains, too. All right, 1958, the last passenger train runs on the Binghamton line to Syracuse. And um, I don't know if you've ever read any of the stories about that, but do you remember Spiegel Wilcox? He was standing on the, on the platform with his band playing, I think, Old Lang Syne as the last train pulled out in Cortland. Yeah. 1960, the Lackawanna is not doing so great, and it merges with the Erie to form the Erie Lackawanna. And only 12 years later, oops, 12 years later, the Lack Erie Lackawanna files for bankruptcy after Hurricane Agnes. You guys remember Hurricane Agnes? I only remember it because I got a week off from school. <laughs> That was a nasty storm. All right. The Erie Lackawanna and six other Northeast railroads f get put together by the government. You know how great the government is when they put things together, right? And they make Conrail. And Conrail kind of decides within a few years that they really don't want the Syracuse line. They don't want the Utica line. There was talk about abandoning it, 
And along comes the Delaware Otsego Corporation in 1982, and they purchase the Syracuse and Binghamton branches and make them part of their New York, Susquehanna, and Western Railroad, which it still is today, right? Okay, you, you got through the you got through the tough stuff. All right, these are some good information sources if you're interesting interested in looking at some of these books. Um, Thomas Tabor and Thomas Tabor the Third have written a, actually a three volume set of great books called the D.L. and W. Railroad in the 20th century. Actually, one is called the 19th century too, and. Then there's The Root of Phoebe Snow, a story of the DL and W by Sheldon King. And there's this one I was talking about with Richard Palmer called Rails Through Portland. Um, this is a, another fantastic book, and that's Scenes Along the Rails and the DL and W's Railroad Syracuse Division. And that's by John Hudson and Suzanne Hudson. I have copies of those books that I'll put out, show you guys when we're done if you're interested in looking at them. Um, I want to point out, because I promised him I would say something, that the black and white photos I'm going to show you today are, were supplied by a gentleman named Pat McKnight. And he is actually, I believe he's technically a ranger in the uh, National Park Service at Steamtown National Park in Scranton. How many, how many have been to Steamtown? Yeah, if you're a real buff, you gotta go to Steamtown. It, and even if you're not, my wife even finds something to look at when we go there, all right? And she's not really in, that much into trains. But the Steamtown has a lot of different railroads equipment, but um, it, it has, a real heritage of the Lackawanna since the Lack that was where the Lackawanna's main base was. That's where it kind of started from. And the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western had um, a photographer that worked for them almost full time. They'd often give him his own car and his own, his own passenger car and his own locomotive and he would travel across the system and take pictures. Now sometimes he would take pictures when they'd had an accident and he was there to take pictures to cover themselves for liability, I think. Other times he would just take pictures of facilities, maybe for insurance purposes or things like that. But there are li literally thousands and thousands of these pictures and this is in the 18th and early 19th, 1900s um, and so he wasn't putting rolls of film into his camera. He was taking eight by 10 pieces of glass and painting on the emulsion probably and then uh, taking pictures with one of those big view cameras, you know, the kinds you had to put your, the hood over your head. So he would travel the system taking pictures and after being in a lot of different places and being stored, um, those negatives have finally ended up at Steamtown and Pat McKnight is doing a fantastic job uh, scanning them in and making them available um, and you can actually look at them online if you go to the Erie Lackawanna Historical Society's um, website. All right, so this, this map, this is a co company map of Messengerville and I started in Messengerville because you guys are Virgil, and this is the little corner of Virgil. It's really, it's really long map, and there's no way to make it so that you can really see it very well. So I blew it up a little bit, and I think I made it even bigger. And if you look at Messengerville, um, things have changed in Messengerville, haven't they? Yeah. One thing that seems to be the same is, is this called Gridley's Creek? Gridley Creek. Gridley Creek. I think Gridley Creek might be in the same place. Um, maybe not, I don't know. Um, but you can see uh, the railroad comes in. I'm just gonna go back here. The railroad had a, a long double siding to the south. And then 
right here before the bridge over the creek was a creamery where they would bring the milk and the, and the cream from the farms. Um, there was a uh, section house where they would keep track equipment and maybe a, uh, any of those, those little cars that they used to transport things on the train, on the uh, train tracks. There's your passenger station, and there's the store that um, we, we've heard some things about. I was hoping Mr. Stevens was going to be here tonight. But he did. You're not here, are you, Mr. Stevens? I met, when I was in Messengerville, a gentleman pulled up to me. I was taking pictures the other day, and his name was Mr. Stevens, and he was telling me he remembers about the, he remembers the store building being there, and obviously it's long gone now. So here's Messengerville looking east, kind of looking over toward the river. This is one of those DL and W slides. And today, kind of is like this. Not much there, is there? No, the creamery, that creamery building would be what, over here? Yep. That's yeah. where Gridley Creek is. Yep. Yeah. Yep, there's Gridley Creek going here. Yeah. Yeah, and can you see that little crossing sign over there? There's a private crossing. That's where the state highway was, I think. All right, this is Messengerville looking northeast across the valley. And some of you know better than me, probably. Is this the store here? Yes. Yeah. There it is now. Now you can see that the road went right across here, didn't it? What and was it, that picture? Um, 19. I think it's uh, 1910. Yeah. So where the road go went then now is all blocked off and actually go would have gone right through this guy's backyard, I guess, and snaked over, kind of curved over to hit, to connect back up with uh, Francis Road, I think. Had to put a roadblock in case you forgot that. <laughs> That you can't go that way. You can you can kind of see where it went, and it went over to Francis Road is right over here, isn't it? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right okay, hey, that's turned around, looking the other way, kind of in that guy's backyard. There's the store again. Is this house is still there, isn't it? Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 And uh, is that barn there too? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Looks like somebody's getting a load of something in, in a gondola there. Yeah. There's the house. If you, if you want me to go back or you see something you want to ask about, just scream. So here we are looking north. And there's the creamery, yep. Yeah. And down there is the store again, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Semaphore signals to tell you whether there's another train in the track ahead. Of course, nowadays there's no signals on that track, are there? How do they 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 get all their permission to use it by radio? Looks like they had a nice little passenger station, doesn't it? Yes, it'll never know it now. <laughs> yeah, it's nothing much there, is there? No. And you can see in this picture, there's a bunch of there's a gang back there working on the tracks, I guess. Huh? There's a train crossing the. Same spot.
There's the road to Dale's house, right? Yeah. <laughs> Do you ever race the train stuff? No, but road? it's scary when you're driving and the train is right next to you. It's oh, so it's narrow. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it must be the day that Mr. Brunel, I think that was the photographer's name, must have been a work day that day because there's a crew out there working. Or he might have been taking pictures because there'd been a derailment or something on there and it was being repaired, I don't know. Do you know whatever happened to a store there that was a messenger belonging to the bird? Or no, it was down? torn down. Some older man was making bows there in the 70s. It must have been a derelict building. It, uh, it wasn't that long ago, and then it was finally condemned and torn down. The foundation is still there. Yep. How about the tree? Yeah, I don't know. It looks like it burned if you go look at the foundation, but I'm not sure. Hmm. I put this one in, it's kind of a damaged slide, but this this kind of shows you, this is one of those glass negatives, and oops, somebody dropped it, didn't they? Yeah. Looking south. South today. So Val, are you saying there's a there's still yeah. a foundation over here? Right there, yeah. The back one is that bridge? Was that bridge in there? Yeah. Yeah. Where's the bridge? Right there. I'm not sure if they've replaced that bridge or if it's the same exact bridge. Yeah. Looks like, looks like, looks like the same one. They made them the last, didn't they? There's a train going over the bridge. So this would be, I'm guessing, I might be wrong on this, this is the old state highway, or no? This, The creamery would be over here? Was there? Or is, did he send me a picture that's not really messenger? <laughs> So I threw in some extra, there's a bunch of other pictures from the area, so I thought it would be interesting to look at a few of those. Um, this is Marathon looking north across uh, 221, right there. You can see the station that is still there today. And it wasn't too many years ago that this track was in, was it? I remember there, they had a caboose sitting on that track for quite a few years. <coughs> And now there's a Dollar General there. <laughs> <laughs> the, looking south, must have been uh, <coughs> Decoration Day or Fourth of July or maybe. What was that little building? That's a good question. The crossing gate. Oh, it might have been a crossing guard shanty. Yeah. That's still on Lowell Street. Oh. They moved it down there? It's right next to the Civic Building, and it's in the Maple Museum. Nice. Look at that building right there. It's the Borden's building, right? So originally, it wasn't, didn't have garage doors in the end of it, did it?
Here's uh, Marathon Warren Street looking west. By the way, when I say west and east and north, um, I talk railroad west, railroad north. This, look at this building right here, because I think we'll see that again. There's what it looks like now, and they eliminated the crossing there at Warren Street, didn't they? But the building, that building is still there. Warren Street looking east. You can see that that house has had some changes done to it, hasn't it? They built a deck on the front of it, or a roof porch. And there's that building. I'm not quite sure. Does anybody know what that building is right there? Part of the electric plant. Is it part of the electric plant? Kilowatt, looking north. I took a lot of pictures of Kilowatt. I'm not sure why. And there it is, looking north today. Church is still there. I didn't get that in a picture, right? The church is there. Kellogg had a nice big railroad station at one time. Yeah, you can just see in the back here, you can just see that feed mill. But they've added to it, I think, over the years. High Street in Lyle. A little bit of a dirt road. There it is now. I don't think that cat was around. <laughs> Looking east on High Street. Not much different. Lyle had a nice railroad station also. What's there now? Pile of top rails. Yeah. Yeah. So they had a double track line in there. Looking south. Okay, so here's the mystery photo. I put a title on this one. Where's this? Kellogg Road? Who said that? Yeah, look at that. Kellogg Road. I didn't take a, I didn't take a now picture, but that's Kellogg Road with the sharp bend. It's all wood on the side, don't you? Yeah, that's your <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, uh, that farm is still there, but it's been falling oh, down, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Those pictures are amazing how much detail for a hero. Yeah. Yeah. Far in the distance, we can see. Okay, so. That's, that's the end of the pictures I have for this line. Do you want to see rebuild pictures on the other ra railroad, or do you, are you done? Okay, here we go. So this is, uh, I threw some pictures in here from the Utica branch flood and some repairs and the first trains this past year. There's. Uh, yeah, that was after 2006. You can't run a train through there. 
this uh, used to be a track here, but there's the river over there, and it took everything away. Same thing in this picture. This creek, instead of running alongside the tracks, you're going to see this again in another picture. It decided it wanted to go straight to the river. Did they run pipes through those when they fixed them? Do you know? They put it, yeah, they put a big culvert. You'll see it in just a second. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they came in. A company, I believe their name was Frontier, came in and won the contract to rebuild it. And they went right to town. And early this year, I don't know, I don't remember Mrs. Ross, what, what was it, was it, what was the date, do you remember? March maybe, or, or April, they ran their first train up through, yes? When you get north of Norwich, how close does the rail line run to the ocean and go In some places it runs right along next to it, in other places it veers away from it. Yeah. Well, it went through the city of Norwich, it was, it was side by side, so it was like, it was a lot. Yes, I think you're right, yeah. Yeah, the old, and, and that's one reason why when you say the Shenango Canal, I don't know if you, a lot of you are aware, but Shenango County or Shenango Valley over there, they got the railroad completed later than this railroad because they already had a canal, right? Not that it ever, it never did as well as the Erie Canal, but it connected with the Erie Canal. Eric, yes. March 10th. March 10th. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, it's in the book. Nice. So there we are, we got a little snow coming down. First locomotive's coming up through. And the only reason this locomotive went up to Utica that day was that the, I think the, um, they needed another locomotive up in Utica instead of the one that they keep up there. This is Norwich. I don't know if, if uh, I don't know if I have a great picture of, Nor of this tower, but you guys know the crossing tower that's over by your railroad station in Cortland? That was a common thing on the Lackawanna Railroad, and Norwich has one too, and they've redone it and put it, they actually moved it. It used to be down the tracks down here somewhere and they moved it up next to their um, town offices. So there's that spot that you were talking about. And there it is now. Now, it's kind of interesting because they put a culvert in, but the original creek went this way and it goes up about a tenth of a mile and then it crosses under under a big bridge. Right. And they said, well, if I guess, I don't, I'm not an engineer. I don't know why they did it this way. They put a culvert in, and I, the th thing was, I guess if the creek does ever wash over there, it'll go through the culvert instead of taking out the tracks. That's just a guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I always try to qualify that. Here's a second train movement that they had this year. They took another lo locomotive up to Utica. Here's Norwich again. Is there any commerce on that track? Or is it just... Um, right now they don't, haven't shipped any freight yet. Uh, according to some sources, they have some people that are interested in shipping by rail. Um, I guess this next year will be the telling the telling thing whether or not they do it. This was the third train they sent up through. A locomotive engineer is a friendly guy. And there's that spot again where the and that's where they tied up. This this um this is a dog food factory up in Sherburne, and they were shipped, they were using the railroad right up, almost I think until it got flooded. So they, and they still make dog food there. So, 
Um, whether or not they start using it again, I don't know. But no. that's it. Okay. Well, that's it. Any questions? In railroads heyday, when there were a lot of passenger trains. Was it cheap enough for the average person to just hop on the train in Messengerville and go up to Syracuse and back in a day? Or was it more of an you know, unusual thing to take the passenger train? I don't think it was prohibitively expensive. I don't think it was like you couldn't do it every day, probably. I, I don't know what the, the actual cost was. And I'm sure it changed and got greater. but. That's a good question. I don't think so. The railroad used to run all kinds of specials, um, like from Norwich and and uh, from down the Syracuse line. They would run specials to take people to the state fair in the summertime. And if you guys have ever fought for a place to park or tried to get into the state fair um, with traffic, uh, might might be nice to get right on that line and go right into Norwich. I mean, into uh, the state fair. Yes. The, that's the Lehigh the second, Valley. The second I know a little bit about it. What What would you like to know? You want to think about the history of it, or um, where it serviced? Because there, there, there's two train stations that fall down. I wondered there might be some reason. Yeah. You had another line there. Yeah. It was a railroad. Yeah. Yeah. The northern became part of the Lehigh Valley. Nice. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Part of that roundhouse is on uh, what street is that? Owego Street. Owego street? Yeah. Um, I was going to say something about that. I forgot. But any other questions? Yes. Uh, if anybody goes to Steam Town, uh, you can buy a uh, one time pass to pull the National Parks including admission to Steam Town uh, if you're a senior for $10, I believe. Wow. It's not going to go one point. How old are you? What's 60 or 80? However, you can use it with a photo ID going to any national park. Yeah. Uh, if you lose it, they keep coming back to so you have to buy it again. But it's good for admission for the rest of your life to any national park. Yeah. It's a great bargain. It is a bargain. I, my wife and I bought that a few years ago. We drove out west and we went, I don't know, 10 different parks, 10 different national parks. And uh, it is, it's a big money saver. Yeah. We have a lot of great national parks in this country that. If you're, it's amazing. You go to them, and there aren't that many Americans there. We have a lot of tourists there, and I just we're always looking at it and saying, "Wow, we we don't visit our own parks." But, yeah. I'm wondering if anyone knows in Messengerville there was a great uh, debate in the newspaper around 1930 
They were paving the road from Virgil. They got as far as Hannah's Stump, which is at the intersection of 392 and Parker Road. And then they stopped because they could not get approval from the railroad to cross it where 392 crosses now. I think it used to cross in those pictures you showed where now it's Mr. Brickner's driveway, down his driveway and across and over to Francis Road. Uh, they were actually contemplating a double bridge at that point over the railroad track and then over the river. Never happened. They couldn't get money for it. So that old Messengerville Bridge used to be at the end of Francis Road. And it was this rickety iron thing that crossed the river right at the end of Francis Road. Finally, a truck fell through it in 1948. And they decided, well, we can't keep putting the school bus over that thing. So they finally put the new bridge over in 1950. But I'm curious to know what happened between 1931, when they were trying to get approval to cross the railroad track where it crosses now, in 1950 when obviously it crossed. You know, I, I don't know, I can't find that in the newspapers and wondered if anyone knew or even remembered because that bridge is not that old, 1950. Would it be in any state archives like the state DOT? Oh, that's a good idea. Look at the actual transportation. I just wonder when the paved road went over where it is now. Maybe it was quite early. I don't know. They replaced the bridge again. Yeah, about four years ago. Really? Yeah. Bill, have you talked to Mr. Brickman? No, I need to go because I'm sure he would remember the road. He told me that I'm the highway superintendent just for a little longer. But he told me that the road, like I'd walk up the con, used to be the, the old road that went up through probably before 392 came in. Right, right. right. Up, up his, his driveway. driveway. Mm -hmm. It keeps right on going right up through. It used to be the Snyder Hill Road. Yeah. Right. Yep. I think mm -hmm. he'd be a wealth of information. Yeah, I'll have to ask him. Hartway Road. Hartway Road? Hartway Road. Hartway is Road. Right. Over right. Hill. Yeah. And that's what it is. When I moved Rickers down, driveway was Hartway Hartway Road. was still alive when I moved to Messengerville. Hmm. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he was still alive. And then uh, there was a building by the railroad tracks, and there was an old, old guy that lived in there. Didn't have any running water, no electricity or anything. And I don't know how he survived in the wintertime, but he did. Hmm. People were tough. He used to, <laughs> he, <laughs> he, he, used to make, he used to make a lot of the Indian stuff and give it to all the kids in the neighborhood, which was pretty dangerous. Is this the, this is the old store? Especially when I had six sons. <laughs> <laughs> was that the old store? Right next to the railroad the, track? Right next to the railroad tracks, yeah. Yeah. I don't remember the old guy's name. He was, he was in his 90s when I moved there. I think that was the man that was making bows, which oh, would make oh, sense yeah. if he liked oh, doing yeah, Indian things. Yeah, he did. He yeah. did. Yeah. He's probably picking up coal along the tracks for He burned all his garbage. <laughs> he, had, he had zero garbage. Because yeah. he'd be proud about it. He burned everything. Uh -huh. <laughs> in, in one of your pictures, there was a, it said Hartley Road at the bottom. I'm not, in one of your old pictures yep. of Messengerville. That's what Brickner's driveway is, Hartley Road. Okay. Yep. Yep. What's interesting in that one picture of Messengerville, there was another road across Gridley Creek. And Eric and I are going to walk it. You can still see it there. It's, it's a path now, but there was a road on the other side of 392, on the other side of the creek, and I'm interested to know where did you that go? You broke up with the mustard road. Yeah. What's the there's mustard road? There's a cemetery road? up in there. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, the there's the Palmer Cemetery. Yeah, yeah, up the mustard road. road. It goes straight up that hill. Yep. Yeah, and then where? Where does it go? It the cross right over where that creamery was. Right, exactly. Right, it went down toward Marathon, but it also went up the hill. It went up the Muster Road, which Muster Road is off in the Highland Road. M U S T E R? Muster. And was that you? When was but that? But the road went up through the woods. Right. Huh. The Hoyts probably and could there's tell a you cemetery all about up in there. An old, old cemetery up on that Muster Road that's overlooking the creek, yeah. which my kids used to call uh, Ice Mountain. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, and that is Steve. And Hoyt, she must, you must remember what the kids call it, Ice Mountain. Mm -hmm. Do you? Yep. The Hoyts can tell you a lot because they've lived there for yeah, lived there two or three generations and they own all it. Make sure you go talk to them before you go take them walk up there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know. They're pretty protected. Yes. But the, the house next door, where I, I bought the middle house by the creek, the middle one. But the one next door to me, that was a store one time too. Really? Where Babbitt slept. Yeah. Remember the main name, Babbitt? Yep. Lee and Babbitt. Well, that was a store and that was a two story. But when I moved there, he took the top story off and just did a single story. My son owns it now. Right, hmm. yep. But that was a store one time too. Interesting. Yeah, I. I guess uh, Messengerville was named after a gentleman named Messenger, right? <laughs> yeah, and but it, originally it was called State Bridge, which of course that was an early state road over to Ithaca from Oxford, believe it or not. And uh, some of those parts, that I've, I've gone over quite a few parts of it. Some of them are well-traveled roads and some of them are almost abandoned back roads. But, yeah. Well, thank you again. You've been a very great audience. I've learned as much as I've taught.